this is what we are talking about right so on the right side we have the internet of things which has been around for a while now but beyond the internet of things more generally if you talk about it it's embedded systems which have been around for a long time then on the left side we have uh, the traditional machine learning jargon ai ml deep learning so this is the kind of things that we have been hearing about in the last 10 years and at the intersection of these two is tiny ml so tiny ml is nothing but enabling embedded devices to do machine learning on the device so typically today what happens or when iot was conceived what was the main uh, use case or the main mode of working the main mode of working will be that sensors will collect data from the environment either motion sensors or camera feeds or audio clips or temperature data humidity data so all this data will be collected by these devices but these devices typically don't have a lot of processing power so what they will do in many of the use cases they will send the data to the cloud and within the cloud you can deploy powerful machine learning models and these models will make sense of the data and do the required predictions so sometime later during this journey maybe towards uh, mid uh, let's say 2015 uh, some of the cloud workloads were shifted to the edge so people started doing uh, edge computing uh, predictions on the edge so that is how you know the iot landscape moved now they are trying to move the machine learning uh, inference or workloads to the device itself so if you have let's say a microcontroller which is having order of only kilobytes of memory ram and uh, even the storage space flash where the model can be stored that is also in the order of kilobytes or at the most 1 mb so even in those situations can we deploy a machine learning model on such a device so that has been the focus of tiny machine learning so don't think that uh, there is some misconception tiny machine learning is a framework or a library it is not so tiny machine learning is a generic term just the way ai and ml are generic terms tiny machine learning is a generic term it is uh, meant to signify machine learning on edge devices or uh, yeah embedded devices so that is the focus uh, of uh, tiny ml before we go into the details let's look at a brief history of how tiny ml came about or what has been the course so far so tiny ml is still very new but uh, still a lot of developments have taken place so we'll quickly go through these developments so one of the early developments i'm not saying this is the first one this is one of the early developments where you know one group of researchers they tried to do quantization and decision tree implementation on an embedded device so this is one of the early implementations and uh, it, at this time uh, we are talking about 2007 it was still too early for deep learning or deep neural networks because these kind of networks came about only in 2012 because of the famous paper which many of us will know the alexnet paper which was submitted for the imagenet competition in 2012 so that is when uh, you know interest towards uh, our development of deep uh, neural networks came about but running deep neural networks on an embedded device it is still very far it is not something that happened uh, in 2007 or even 2012 then somewhere around uh, this decade 2010 to 2020 there was a lot of interest and growth in iot so this is where iot really kicked in the term iot itself was coined maybe uh, more than 10 years earlier from here but real iot development and uh, interest in the industry happened during this decade 2012 2014 and then by 2020 we had something like 10 to 12 billion iot devices which were uh, you know provisioned or active so there was a lot of interest in iot during this decade so this set the stage for tiny ml to emerge because until then tiny ml did not have very strong uh, requirement but when iot took off 
lot of devices were deployed, provisioned in, in uh, networks. Then a need was felt that we can't send all this data to the cloud and uh, start doing predictions in the cloud. So there should be a way to do predictions on these devices themselves. So that set the stage for TinyML to emerge. And interestingly, one of the early developments was uh, this formation of this TinyML Foundation, which happened in 2013. But uh, from what I read in the literature, they have not been that active uh, subsequently. So the real uh, impetus to TinyML came about somewhere around 2019, when Google announced TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. So uh, many of you know Google's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, TensorFlow was started in Google, and then later it was open sourced. And from TensorFlow in 2017, Google announced it on TensorFlow Lite. So this was meant to be a lightweight version of TensorFlow, which you could execute on mobile and embedded devices. So that was what TensorFlow Lite brought about. And uh, in this time frame, we are talking about 2017, with TensorFlow Lite, it became possible now to deploy deep learning networks, deep neural networks for inference on smartphones. So we are still not talking about uh, embedded devices in the sense of microcontrollers, right? 16-bit microcontrollers with uh, RAM of just kilobytes of RAM and uh, kilobytes of flash memory. We are not yet there. But in 2017, there was this uh, development where you could deploy deep neural networks on smartphones. And that was powered by TensorFlow Lite. So if you look at the numbers, it is very surprising. The interpreter for this neural network takes only 300 KB compared to 1.5 MB of TensorFlow Mobile, which was a slightly earlier uh, framework released by Google. So TensorFlow Lite was positioned as an evolution of TensorFlow Mobile. So if we are talking about few hundred kilobytes. That is the kind of uh, thing we are talking about to deploy a deep, uh, deep neural network. But note that this is a kind of optimized network, mobile net inception v3. But if you talk about uh, convolutional neural network, the way AlexNet was designed, that is, uh, it was not possible to deploy such a big uh, neural network for a smartphone. But in between, people came out with these kind of optimized networks, mobile net, squeeze net. Some of you might have heard of these terms. So they are, uh, you know, below one uh, MB. The model size is below one MB or a few MB at the most. So they now it was possible to deploy those kind of deep neural networks on a smartphone. But in 2019, uh, again the game was uh, changed. TensorFlow Lite, specifically optimized for microcontrollers, came about. And uh, in one particular demo, they uh, it was demonstrated on a Spark Fun. Uh, dev board, which has an ARM Cortex M4, only 384 kilobytes of RAM, 1 MB of flash. And you will be surprised in, if you look at the numbers. The model took only 20 kilobytes of flash storage. And the framework itself, TensorFlow Lite, took another 25 KB. RAM usage was only 30 KB. So you can see the numbers have been slashed from the order of hundreds of kilobytes or 1 MB to the order of uh, just below 100 KB. So this is the kind of development that took place. And the term tiny ML became popular or started getting used around this time, 2019. And uh, the very next year, uh, now we are in 2020. So Amazon embeds a neural edge processor within its line of Echo devices. You know that Echo devices power the Amazon Alexa, which is the equivalent of uh, Apple's Siri or Google's uh, Google Home kind of uh, voice interfaces. So Alexa was uh, enabled by Echo devices, and typically these Echo devices, uh, they send, collect the data, that is speech data, send it to the cloud, and in the cloud, uh, typically, it is AWS. In the cloud, these, this data will be processed and then it will recognize what sort of command the user is giving. But this relaying of data from the Echo device to the cloud and then making prediction on the cloud, 
giving back the control to the echo device that has a associated latency so the idea here was to break this latency and make it more uh, real time so what amazon did they used a neural edge processor in those uh, uh, echo devices now what became possible because of the developments earlier such as tensor flow light for microcontrollers and so on these developments enabled us to do prediction on the device itself so now in 2020 it was possible to process alexa voice commands on the echo device itself and latency was much improved and you uh, and the prediction was possible on even on a character by character basis not just words so these these are some of the advancements that happened but interestingly recently you might have seen september 2023 right alexa was again upgraded now alexa uses generative ai but now we this is i see this sort of a regression because now generative ai which is like powered by llms which are many orders of magnitude they cannot be running on the edge devices you cannot run llms on a echo device for example that defeats the purpose so you have to run uh, this kind of things on the cloud so now here there is a uh, like we have regressed a little bit in the sense that we have sacrificed accuracy uh, sorry we have sacrificed latency for accuracy because obviously llms are better in terms of uh, accuracy so that's why they have migrated to LL llms but what do we sacrifice in the process we sacrifice uh, latency because now you have to send the data to the cloud but i am sure a day will come when llms can also be executed on echo devices so i am sure that is the next uh, thing that people are working on but meanwhile in 2020 this was the state of the art so you have here three groups or three modes in which you know ai can be deployed deployed one is the traditional way which is cloud ai where you have let's say typically when you are running a vm and you have access to gpus and stuff like that you will be using something like nvidia 16 gb of uh, memory ram and your models can be very big terabytes and uh, even larger so you have access to huge storage so there is no limitation on practically no limitation on how large your models can be even chat gpt it doesn't go to this level of petabytes so you have huge resources at your disposal then we came to doing things on the edge so this is also like embedded ai but then uh, you look at the numbers you still have access on the on a phone like iphone 11 you have 4 gb of ram you have storage access of 64 gb so it was easy uh, on platforms like this to deploy a deep neural network so that is what we saw starting from 2017 but today when we talk about tiny ml we are not talking about mobile ai we are talking something of this order where the amount of ram that you have is in the order of few hundred kb and the uh, storage that you have is less than 1 mb that means your model should fit within 1 mb of uh, space so that is the whole idea here but in 2020 the state of the art was most of the uh, neural networks required this kind of numbers 100 mb where is 100 mb where is 1 mb so there is a huge gap right so you could not de uh, deploy a resnet 50 on a embedded device like this this is a st micro electronics device 32 bit but then there are as i mentioned earlier there are more optimized networks so one of them is the mobile net which doesn't take 100 mb it takes only 13 mb but still it was a challenge to deploy this on this kind of a device but then you can quantize do some quantization on mobile net and some other optimizations and that will bring down the model size to 3 mb now 3 mb is a pretty good figure but still big enough to fit in this kind of a form factor but this was the state of the art in 2020 today we have come beyond that so as i mentioned uh, some of the numbers here 
and uh, some some other research let's say in 2020 the same group which gave this diagram they came up with their own network called mcu net so this uh, with this net it was possible to deploy even a, uh, like a visual application so there is an application called person detection it's a very simple application where if a person enters the field of view of a camera the ai ml model will give an alert so this is called visual wake word just like we have uh, wake words uh, in uh, siri or google home or alexa in the visual domain also they have something called person detection where they which they have given it a name visual wake words so in 2020 this group of researchers they managed to fit a, such a model which is basically a deep neural network they managed to fit it within 1 mb of flash and they gave it a name mcu net so this was the state of the art in 2020 then in 2021 people started researching on on device training so you see most of the applications we have seen so far running up to 2020 it is all about inference where you have trained the model and then you somehow fit the mod optimize the model and fit it into a lower form factor which you can deploy on an embedded device and all you do on that device using that model is inference not training but in 2021 people started researching on how you can do training on an embedded device so why is this important because in embedded devices or in the en environment in which they operate the conditions are always changing the environment is very dynamic so the training that you had done maybe a few weeks ago that may no, no longer be relevant in the sense that the accuracy that you get from the model may deteriorate over time so there is a need to continuously retrain the model so it is in this uh, for this requirement that people started researching into on device training uh, so uh, two common terms which you may come across i just want to mention it online learning incremental learning so as new data arrives the model is updated so that is what this is all about so that is the that was the focus in 2021 then in 2022 people started talking about tiny ml ops which is basically a subset of ml ops which is how you can make uh, ML more operationally efficient. That is to say, how you can take a model, optimize it for any architecture, any hardware, how you can verify that this solution works on that hardware, how you can integrate with the hardwares, uh, with the firmware of that system. So these are the main concerns of tiny ML ops, right? But Having said that, now we are one year past that, but tiny ML ops is still at an early stage. So having uh, discussed all this, now the obvious question for many people is, can we fit tiny ML on an 8-bit microcontroller? Right? See, most of the discussion so far has been, uh, like I made reference to ARM, um, uh, Cortex-M, Cortex-A, but these are all 32-bit microcontrollers from ARM. But the question is, can we fit a neural network model on an 8-bit microcontroller? On the face of it, it seems to be possible because some of the numbers we looked at, right? Here we looked at only few kilobytes of flash, RAM, and storage. So given these numbers, it seems to be possible that yes, uh, there are it looks like possible so one of the advances they came about was in 2021 and this is one of the few platforms out there this is called the newton tiny ml we so this was a company started in 2021 and they have come up with a method i think it is patented where they discover given the data they discover an optimized data means uh, training data given a set of training data they can discover an optimized neural network. So based on a neural architectural search. And this kind of a network is so optimized that it can run even on an 8-bit microcontroller. 
So uh, this is one of the exciting developments that took place uh, in uh, 2021. And uh, probably there are some competitors right now. But as far as I could make out, uh, these guys have done a good job. So you can take a look at their websites, uh, Newton Tiny ML, where an 8-bit microcontroller with just few kilobytes of RAM and the storage, you can deploy a neural network. So here I will give a pause uh, for Q and A before we move on. Any questions at this point? So some some more people have joined. Uh, how many of you are uh, working in either IoT or machine learning? Hands up. Okay, yeah, Vishwanatha is there, yes. Okay, uh, Ramanagan. Okay, Radha Krishnan, you had a question, go ahead. So effectively, you're saying that tiny ML is something that um, optimizes on things like 8-bit controllers and stuff like that with implements explores implementing machine learning on that sort of capacity is that is that correct or would i be right partly correct uh, see tiny ml is okay. not just for 8-bit uh, it can also be used on 16-bit 32-bit uh, microcontrollers in general okay. uh, what is the uh, so this since you asked that question i'll show the diagram which expresses mm -hmm. uh, So take a look at this diagram where it compares cloud ML, mobile ML, and tiny ML. So tiny ML is not just 8-bit. Uh, All these are 16-bit. Cortex, ARM um, Cortex is nothing but, uh, sorry, sorry, 32-bit. But generally, tiny ML is uh, characterized by anything which uh, where the code will fit within 1 MB, generally. Right here, sometimes they may consider this also tiny ML. But generally now in the industry, the consensus is the code has to fit within 1 MB. And the amount of memory you have uh, is in the order of just few hundred kilobytes. The processor is not very powerful. It's not in the range of gigahertz, right? Your mobile will be 2 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz high-end mobiles. But TinyML runs on processors which are just few hundred megahertz and uh, less mm -hmm. than that. Power consumption is another factor. The power must be very small. So 0 0.1 watt, for example, or in the order of uh, microwatt, milliwatts. Yeah, milliwatts is a reasonable number. And uh, yeah, the number of floating point operations. In some cases, some of the systems like Cortex M0, it doesn't have any floating point uh, uh, unit. So all computations on Cortex M0 are fixed point. So that is also another consideration. Can you deploy your model on a fixed point processor? Then mm -hmm. comes pricing, right? So this is here, the, you can see huge difference, cloud, mobile. When you look at tiny ML, the modules or the systems are in the order of few dollars. So these mm -hmm. are the characteristics of a tiny ML. So it's not just 8-bit, but it can also be 32-bit, but how do you define tiny ML? These are the ways. Memory, flash size, frequency, power, flops, and the pricing. So it's, in other words, it's, it's scalable either ways. That's what, that's what you're saying, that's the advantage. I mean, yeah. scalable. Any, uh, any yeah. other questions or related questions? Yes, sir. thanks. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yep. One quick question, Arvind. Uh, yeah. So, from the edge device, calling a model in cloud would uh, work out cheaper than working on a model which will fit in the edge device. What do you mean cheaper? You don't need so much of a RAM or a, a, a you know, model size can be larger. Uh, all that you will spend on is the call to the cloud and you get the prediction. 
Yeah, so uh, see, to answer this question, I think it is better I tell you what are the advantages of going to uh, TinyML. Why are we people, why are people lo even looking at TinyML? So the main thing is there are some applications, uh, we talked about Alexa just now, where there is a latency issue. See, the cost is not the consideration here. There is the okay. issue of latency. So they want okay. more immediate responses. And similarly, there are some applications where this timing could be very critical, such as in industrial IoT, where you want to immediately catch, if a sensor is detecting some anomaly, you want to catch it immediately and take corrective action. You can't wait okay. for the data to go to the cloud and then uh, take corrective action. Okay. So likewise, okay. uh, let's say yeah, somebody in healthcare, they are wearing some sort of a health monitor for, uh, looking at uh, heart uh, heart rate patterns and so they want to do uh, a prediction on the device itself let's say the user is wearing the device it could be mm -hmm. a watch or it could be a smartphone he is carrying nearby so they they want to do the prediction on the device rather than relying on the cloud to do the prediction and only if an anomaly is detected they want to alert the cloud or alert somebody in the healthcare uh, sector so mm -hmm. the latency is the issue there, uh, and that is uh, where many of the use cases are coming from. Okay, okay, understood. So it's not about the cost, it's about the latency. Then the second reason is connectivity. See, in many use cases, let's say you are in the agricultural sector, uh, where most of the sensors are deployed in a remote location, and you have no access to the cloud. So in this kind of a deployment, the sensors have to act on their own. For example, they have to detect what is the condition of the soil, what is the current weather, and take action in terms of uh, irrigation or you know, giving notifications, whatever it may be. So again, in remote locations where there is no possibility of connecting to the cloud, that is where uh, on-device predictions come into play. Then the third important reason is that uh, you may have connectivity to the cloud in some use cases, but problem is the sensor devices do not have supply of power. They are battery operated devices. So assume okay. all things are just like cloud. You have enough RAM, enough processing power, right? You have connectivity to the cloud. You are getting sensor data. Only thing you lack is battery power. You don't. Uh, Sorry, you, you don't have connectivity to the power supply. So the device mm -hmm. is running purely on battery power. And many of these IoT devices, they are supposed to run for, let's say, one or two years without changing the battery. Now, in this okay. kind of situation, the uh, parameter to be optimized is the energy, energy consumption. So you cannot deploy a huge model, even though you, the system may have enough RAM, enough storage, for reasons of energy consumption, you cannot deploy such a huge model. So there is a need to optimize the model from the perspective of power. So that is why power is another important column here. Okay, got it. Uh, so these are th overall the main reasons. One is energy consumption. Second is uh, connectivity. Third is uh, latency. There are okay. other reasons, but these are the main reasons. Okay, one quick follow up. Uh, sorry to take time. Uh, uh, does the edge devices uh, support external flash or anything of that sort? Just in case if somebody has to go for it. No, that is all variables. Yeah, so that is all depending on how you design the hardware, how you play with these parameters. Okay, so that possibility is external, there. external, you need some extra power. So if power is there, people have uh, considered all those trade-offs. They can, uh, of course, have uh, something external. Okay, that yeah. is a possibility. Yeah. Thanks. See, normally what is happening today uh, is the hardware is fixed. Assume that you are given this hardware and these are the parameters with which you want to work with. Now the machine learning engineer comes along and he will try to see current DNA and deep neural networks. How can I optimize for this form factor? That is the current state of the approach. That means Somebody will say, this is the kind of device I'm going to deploy for my application. Now the machine learning expert has to come in and say, 
what kind of model is possible on this system. That means the constraint is given to you and you have to see how your model can fit into this kind of a constraint without sacrificing the accuracy. OK, got it. Thanks. Yeah. Any further questions? Actually, it's good we have questions because uh, many things I've already covered, like the different kind of hardware. Anything further to ask, Vishwanath? You have anything to ask? OK. Yes. Uh, uh, no, no, sir, so far. No, sir. OK, OK. So is... we'll move on. Thank Since you. we were discussing about the hardware, I will show you a more, uh, what shall I say? A more detailed comparison of the hardware. So take a look at this figure, which has frankly too many details or too many platforms have been compared, but we'll look at the main ones. So this is ST microelectronics 32 bit ARM Cortex M4. Processor is running at 48 megahertz. Flash is only 1 MB. RAM is 192 KB. Operates on 3 to 5 volts and it has some connectivity sensors and so on. So OK, so we understood some of things 32 bit 1 MB. Few kilo of uh, 200, let's say kilobytes of RAM. Take something else. Uh, Let's say this is another popular one, Arduino Nano from Arduino ecosystem. And this is called Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense. So obviously it has a Bluetooth uh, connectivity and uh, traditional wire connectivities, UART, USB and so on. But wireless, it has a Bluetooth connectivity. Now again, the form factors uh, is same, 64 megahertz, 1 MB of flash, 256 KB of uh, this uh, SRAM storage and voltage is 3.3. Uh, so this again qualifies under a tiny ML. Let's take something else. Uh, we'll take a Sony uh, board, Sony Spree Sense. So again, ARM Cortex M4. And uh, but now you see the memory here is slightly higher. 8 MB, 1.5 MB. 156 megahertz. So on other factors, you know, uh, it is similar. Processing power, voltages, power consumption, it might be similar, but it's it's got more storage. So this is uh, uh, what we see here. And you might wonder why it has more storage, right? So you have to see what is the, you know, USP of Sony. Sony is very strong in image processing, right? So one of the things which this platform is capable of is a camera. Whereas if you take this Arduino Nano, this the kind of applications are enabled by this Arduino Nano is microphone, gestures, and other simpler sensors, proximity, barometer, temperature, humidity. These are the kind of things which this kind of a platform is capable of. And as a result, the memory is also planned accordingly lower memory but sony coming from a you know image processing background their memory requirements are higher because camera applications are now enabled on this platform and for the same reason they have a i2s interface which is the interface used by cameras whereas that kind of interface is lacking on the arduino nano and we can also compare here stm32 so 32 bit microcontroller again lower memory interfaces are not many and very simple application just microphone and accelerometer so you can see here the kind of applications that are that can, that are possible here are probably limited let's take some one more example raspberry pi right we all know raspberry pi but look at the processing here now it is an order of magnitude bigger. It is 1.5 gigahertz. We are no longer talking about megahertz. And it is a 64-bit ARM Cortex. 
and it is not even a arm cortex m it is a arm cortex a the kind of uh, processor that typically you have on a smartphone so again this is a different beast right you can also consider this as tiny ml but remember that this is completely different from what we have been talking about here arduino nano so this is in the order of 1 mb and 256 kb but this one is in the order of again 256 kb but this one is open ended actually why it is not given because raspberry pi doesn't come with any storage rather it has a sd slot sd card slot so that sd card can be a very high sd card you can put 64 mb for if you want sorry, sorry it can be even in in the order of gb right so it can be a very big uh, storage but main thing is processor 64 bit 1.5 gigahertz and a uh, lot of applications can be provisioned on the raspberry pi so here they are given only temperature but much more is possible because like the ramanathan pointed out raspberry pi is a extendable ecosystem so you can buy peripherals add it to the raspberry pi and suddenly you have host of other applications which are possible on the raspberry pi so one more example we'll take from a different manufacturer this is texas instruments so they have a lot of wireless mcus in their uh, lineup and you look at the numbers 48 megahertz 352 kilo kilobytes 8 kilobytes so very little ram is given in this kind of a system and uh, what kind of applications so the typical interfaces are there plus uh, it's got sub gigahertz uh, wireless interface for 433 megahertz plus ble and you can also deploy some lightweight protocols like thread zigbee and so forth so th because it's got uh, decent amount of storage you can deploy protocol stacks also on these systems and some of you if you are interested in risk 5 hardware those kind of hardware also now part of the tiny ml uh, ecosystem and nordic uh, again a very uh, important uh, manufacturer so they also have their lineup of uh, boards and uh, socs so here you have a nordic semi 64 megahertz arm cortex m4 1192 kilo 24 kilo so one of the things i want to point out here is arm cortex m family they have slightly more power compared to the arm cortex m0 right so m0 we saw that earlier i'll open that uh, diagram again so this is a comparison of m4 and m0 so m0 is uh, really targeted for uh, very low end applications so 8 kb and 16 kb whereas if you compare it against m4 you can see a big difference in both the memory as well as flash then slightly higher is m7 but practically today most people are talking about only m4 and m0 for tiny ml but now enter 8 bit microcontrollers into the picture so then you can go even you don't even have to look at cortex m0 you can take any uh, other kind of ecosystems so arduino you know for example that is a i think it's a 8 bit uh, microcontroller in uh, so in uh, uh, devopedia we uh, used to organize hands on iot workshops using this particular platform which is from texas instrument msp 430 f5529 so this platform look at the numbers here 25 megahertz 128 kb of flash 8 kb of sram and uh, the processor is probably 16 bit i don't know if it is mentioned here it is uh, probably a 16 bit processor so now these kind of processors 
can also be used in the tiny ml ecosystem because uh, of uh, some of the things that i showed earlier so now we go to the frameworks which enable tiny ml so one of the exciting frameworks which i talked about just now is newton tiny ml so we look at their website make edge devices intelligent look at this amazing number less than 1 kb is an average model size achieved by our neural framework right it becomes first time when you look at it it's kind of hard to believe but this is where the industry is moving and already we are here right and even on a 8 bit microcontroller you can deploy a neural network and uh, like 10 times smaller models compared to other existing algorithms that means we are not even talking about alexnet here we are talking about other tiny ml algorithms which are out there compared to that it is 10x better and uh, one iteration is enough to build an accurate fast and incredibly tiny model so yeah this is truly amazing and i would say this is kind of state of the art so this is where uh, we are today and to give you a sense of this let's look at one of the use one of the examples where somebody has used that newton uh, ecosystem and built probably an example is already there out there but he has built and deployed it on a 8 bit microcontroller so this example is where it is simply binary classification okay and uh, in this example it is uh, gesture recognition and there are only two gestures one is punching so this is the punch gesture and the other is the flex gesture so you can probably guess what is the domain here this is uh, in the sports domain you are talking about boxing and you can imagine probably you can fit a sensor in the glove of the boxer and uh, on the device you can make predictions whether it's a punch or it's a flex so this is the kind of application we are looking at and uh, from uh, in ml lingo this is nothing but binary classification but uh, data is coming through sensors and this is not image classification that is to say you don't have a camera to figure out whether it's a punch or a flex rather data is captured using an accelerometer so accelerometer will give you data in x y z coordinates and this blog article here he actually describes how he has collected the data for training and then how he feeds the data to the newton ecosystem so training is done in the cloud so after collecting the data you go to the newton website so this is what he shows here you do go to the newton website and then you upload the data right so once you upload the data as a csv file that's what he shows here you upload the data as a csv file then newton uh, has its own uh, uh, like proprietary methods to figure out what kind of a neural network will suit best for this particular set of data so this is one of the interesting approaches that is taken up by newton because before newton came about uh, what was the general approach in the industry for tiny ml the general approach was take an existing model let's say mobile net or squeeze net take a model which is already out there which is trained on the cloud trained for let's say deployment on a mobile phone or maybe deployment in the cloud so that mo uh, that model is very huge like we spoke uh, discussed it's in the order of hundreds of mb so take that kind of a model then do certain optimizations on those models so optimization uh, some of the optimization te techniques are like quantization that is instead of 32 bit weights you use 8 bit weights so that is quantization and then you do pruning that is to say you figure out if some of the layers can be removed or 
you can bring down the number of neurons in a particular layer. So that kind of pruning is done and optimizations uh, of weights and so on. So a bunch of techniques they used to optimize existing models towards uh, TinyML platforms. That was the state of the art. But Newton changed the game by saying that let's not do that. Let's figure out a model from the scratch. But let's not use existing architectures and uh, you know be constrained by the architecture. So they have a system which will figure out what is the best architecture given a set of data. Right. So this is kind of auto ML, which in the traditional domain we call auto ML. That is what is happening here. This is auto ML for embedded systems. So given a set of data, the system figures out what is the best model for this data. So you don't even need. I mean, the fact is that you don't even need machine learning experts now because you just feed in the data. It will tell you this is the model. Just go ahead and deploy it on your embedded device. So this is what it is, Newton. And uh, yeah, this blog gives you a sense what it is. So like I said, training is nothing but auto ML. You don't even need machine learning uh, expert for this. And uh, you can now take this model, which is, as I said, in the, it's in the order of few KB, nothing more than few KB, and you can deploy it on your uh, device. So this is the kind of state of the art and uh, the framework we are talking about is Newton. But of course you may be wondering what are the other frameworks out there? So obviously there are other frameworks out there. Show you yeah, this diagram. So you can see here what are the other frameworks out there? So this uh, diagram is slightly old, slightly old, uh, or at least they have not captured the Newton uh, platform that we spoke about just now. But uh, there are a bunch of uh, other platforms. One of them is TensorFlow Lite for embedded uh, for microcontrollers. So this can run on ARM Cortex M. It's based on TensorFlow. And uh, it's uh, C plus plus eleven, and the algorithm is neural network. Then uh, something simpler is a Weka Porter, where you know it's a bunch of uh, algorithms, uh, bunch of languages, but it is limited to a decision tree. So there are some older uh, frameworks like Weka Porter or MicroML Gen. You know, which are based on C, but they don't support neural networks. They support the earlier machine learning uh, approaches like decision tree, RVM, support vector machine, and then a bunch of these here. You can see here mLearn, M2C Gen. So here the earlier architectures, Bayesian classification, decision trees, random forest, logistic regression, so these kind of linear regression, so these kind of classical machine learning uh, algorithms or approaches, they are supported in are supported in these kind of platforms. But today everyone is moving towards neural network approaches. So for these kind of algorithms, we have these things: TensorFlow Lite. Then from ST Micro Electronics, they have 32 Cube AI. Then we have this one from uh, this is ALFES, which is not open source, but uh, this also supports uh, neural networks. So this is again uh, a well-known uh, framework. Then uh, yeah, Nano Edge AI Studio and so forth. So you have a bunch of things. Uh, Micro Tensor, that's also one which is often uh, quoted in the literature. So we have a bunch of frameworks that you can choose from. But what sets these frameworks apart from what we just spoke about, that is Newton. Newton figures out the architecture based on the data. So it is auto ML for, for tiny ML. Whereas these kind of frameworks, they take an existing model and then optimize it for tiny ML. So the approaches are very different. 
but it won't be long before these guys also start adopting auto ml approaches now uh, what so we spoke about neural network in general but those of you who are in in the domain working in the domain of machine learning you may be wondering what kind of neural networks so we already uh, had some discussion on that mobile net squeeze net and so forth but take a look at this slide this gives a little bit more detail of what is possible so you have cnns lstms then certain variants of cnns which is customized for uh, tiny ml then uh, grus which is uh, again like uh, recurrent neural networks like lstms then we have uh, crnn so which is a combination of cnns and rnns because each one cnns have their pros and cons rnns have their pros and cons so why not combine the two so that that is this model crnn and then the plain dnns so you can see here just take uh, let's take an example of dscnn you can see here dscnn alone it gives two very different uh, points on this graph there is a point here and there is a point here right what is the difference between these two points this one has a higher accuracy 95.39% whereas this one is just 1% lower 94.45% but this model is vastly pre preferred because look at the operations it is 10 times lower this is 100 uh, mega flops this one is 10 mega flops and look at the memory usage this is in the order of this is a log scale by the way so this one is in the order of 200 kb uh, sorry 10 20 kb whereas this one is in the order of probably 200 kb or more than that right so it is a one magnitude higher so now if i am uh, a design engineer i will obviously choose this because this is so much lower in terms of memory as well as in operations operations translates to saving of the battery power memory means my cost is reduced my devices don't need such large memory and again less memory also translates to less data access which means that again you will save on power so what you sacrifice by this you sacrifice only 1% of accuracy which may be a good trade off right so you now the next question may be how is it that the same model gives two different uh, numbers and the reason is the researchers in this paper they did hyperparameter tuning and when we talk about hyperparameter tuning it's not just in terms of the neural network in the sense number of neurons number of layers and uh, learning rate and stuff like that it is also about uh, other parameters which are needed for tiny ml such as power consumption memory and so forth so through hyperparameter optimization they came so this was probably where they started then they sacrifice some accuracy and then they landed up here and likewise for other models lstm cnns you can compare right so there is a cnn here 92% but then there is also a cnn here which is 91% and uh, dnn this is also a good number dnn 86% they sacrifice 2% but then they realize uh, reduce the memory consumption 10 times and then uh, operations are also reduced 10 times so yeah these are some of the things which are happening uh, in the world of tiny ml and i would say in conclusion the landscape is very much fluid right now lots a lot of research is going on tiny ml tiny ops auto ml for tiny ml 
and uh, in the next few years uh, i think we are going to see more and more uh, machine learning algorithms coming to the to the edge i mean uh, edge in the sense even 8 bit microcontrollers will have these kind of things so i'll give you i show you one more uh, i didn't show you this earlier what kind of applications plenty of applications this is something i picked up from arm website so for vision object detection human pose estimation depth estimation for voice keyword spotting which is typically used in applications like alexa uh, speech recognition beam forming noise suppression machine translation so even machine translation probably it is not yet there but i think this is also something which will become available on the edge then uh, vibration so this is again mostly uh, it could be in healthcare but it it could also be in uh, industrial iot on on the factory floor so human activity detection uh, recognition industrial anomaly detection sensor fusion motor control predictive failure so this is just tip of the iceberg i am sure there are many more applications out there which can be enabled by tiny ml so that's it uh, for, for from me for this session we'll have a follow up on this uh, at a later date maybe 6 months from 6 months from now where we will track what are the latest changes in tiny ml plus uh, we can also have a demo or even a hands on workshop so now i'll open up for questions anyone has any questions i hope you found it interesting any questions okay how many of you are interested in hands on workshop because we have the hardware with the tiny yes. ml on tiny hands ml on? yeah with the tiny yes, ml yes. yeah okay i would be king but we need a venue yeah. obviously for this we need a venue so uh, like i pointed out earlier in the discussion we used to do uh, workshops on msp 430 f5529 so we we already have this hardware with us so we can always do a tiny ml workshop uh, based on this hardware 